But I really want to get into this hour uh, to start is this New Orleans Saints game. Because the further that you get away from this game uh, and the more that people are able to dissect this film, and admittedly I have not uh, been able to. We don't have the all 22 from NFL.com that you can get, which is actually a great deal. Uh, but the more I read, you know, Holder and Duncan and Underhill, um, I, I just cannot help but be so impressed with what you saw out of this New Orleans Saints team. And it's at every level, right? It's on the line of scrimmage, it's in the middle, it's in the in the back when you're talking about the defensive secondary or the wide receivers. It's on the coaching staff. And really, I want to start with Sean Payton because when you go back and you look at that game, one thing that he did, uh, and, and Nick wrote extensively about this on New Orleans on football, and it's, and it's fascinating, is how he decided to employ personnel groupings this last game. And I can't get away, a lot of times when I'm talking about football, I can't get away from these boxing analogies, right? Where a, a lot of times offense and play calling can feel a bit like a fighter. Uh, you, you, you're kind of jabbing, you're hooking, you're fainting. Maybe you're trying to establish some tendencies that you later break with like a big haymaker type of shot. You constantly want to disguise your attacks, though, so they don't know where it's coming from. Well, how about this? The Saints used 18 different personnel groupings this last game. And, and look, there's no one way to skin a cat, right? One of the great advantages of like the LSU national champions last year is that they only really needed one personnel grouping. It was their 11 personnel that had Thad Moss, Clyde Edwards, Lair, and the three big receivers, and you just let it ride. And that has its own advantage. You can play with too fast tempo. Uh, you don't allow the other team to sub. Uh, like, like they, there's a lot to be had there. Um, the Saints, though, employing the polar opposite technique, used 18 different personnel groupings. And then where it truly gets masterful and truly gets so confusing, if you think about it from the terms of you are an opponent trying to play defense against this team, not only are the groupings constantly different, so you can't really get a tell of what they're going to do, but how about this? Think about the guys that can play multiple positions, right? You can line up Alvin Kamara running back. You can line up a wide receiver. You can line up Taysom Hill anywhere on the field. Deontay Harris continues to be a weapon no matter how you use him. And so not only do you have an offense where the faces are constantly shifting, but even the faces that you recognize, their roles are constantly shifting. So how do you know what to defend? How do you guess what the Saints are going to hit you with? And, and, and that was, I mean, that was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right? It was quite literally, go back to our fighter analogy, it was like they never saw where the punches were coming from. They're expecting a hook. They're getting jabbed. They're leaning in. They think they got a big shot. They're catching an uppercut to the jaw. That's what it would felt like all night long. And so much of that started with Sean Payton and, and, and a masterful game plan, masterfully executed and masterfully called. Uh, we, we talked about it on Monday show, but I mean, just look at the first drive, right? The, the, the tendency breakers having Hill throw that ball. Nick Underhill broke down the passing concept. Um... The, the I love the touchdown to Traquan Smith where it looks like 100% you're going to run that screen to Alvin Kamara, a little tunnel screen after you motion him out, kind of get everybody focused on him. And so Sean Payton, take a bow. And I know that he was upset after game number one, feeling that he did not put his best foot forward against Tampa in that first game. And if you think back, the play calling in the offense was very stilted that game. This game was anything but. And, and, and how could you not, if you're talking about a varied and confusing attack that's multiple in so many different ways. How could you not talk about Taysom Hill? Was this the best Swiss Army Knife Taysom Hill game ever? I mean, I know the Vikings playoff loss probably stands out. He did a lot there as well. But in terms of a 19-yard pass, seven carries for 54 yards, a 21-yard catch, how he affects the defense just in terms of the amount of focus that, 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 that he demands and, and how they try to react to him, right? They see him line up in third and three in shotgun. They go to zero coverage. And then you break that tendency, and he's able to throw it. So a great job by Taysom Hill. And then on the opposite side of the ball, it, to me, this game felt so. Remember how with LSU, they, they, they kick the hell out of South Carolina. Then they fall completely flat on their face against Auburn. Offensively, what was the biggest deciding factor between those two performances? Right? I mean, T.J. Finley played both games. To me, it was the offensive line. And we've talked about that. The O-line played their best game against South Carolina. Everything worked because of it. They played their worst game against Auburn. Nothing worked because of it. Well, the Saints defensively were that exact same relationship between line and success in this Tampa Bay game. Um, the defensive line dominated. 
three sacks, nine quarterback hits. And I'm going to mention pressures here. And look, pressures will vary from one site to another, right? Nick charted his pressures. PFF charts theirs. But listen to some of these numbers. So David Onyemata, on top of having to pick, David Onyemata had 10 pressures in this Tampa Bay game. And you want to talk about how to be a winning football team, how to shut down any elite quarterback, it is being able to get home with four. And the key to being able to get home with four is truly on the interior. Because if you can't get interior pushed, and I don't care how good your edge rushers are, Tom Brady will just step up. Why couldn't he step up? Because his Saints were in his face. So you have David Onyemata, who not only has a pick, who's not only providing interior pressure to then help out Hendrickson and Jordan and Davenport off of the edge, but he also had 10 pressures himself. And then how about Trey Hendrickson? What is he, third in the league now in sacks? On pace for 15 and a half? It used to be the Trey Hendrickson double-digit sack dream. Now it's the Trey Hendrickson 15 sack dream. But when you look, uh, PFF, if, and if you want to follow a great account on Twitter, PFF Saints, um, if you're a Saints fan, is very satisfying. But Trey Hendrickson has nine pressures himself. A 91.7 pass rush grade, a 28% pass rush win rate, which means that he is winning his rep nearly 30% of the time, which is very hard to do. But how about this? Just to give you some context, because those are just numbers, that is the highest grade of any NFL edge rusher, edge rusher, any NFL edge rusher on Sunday Night Football this year. So, like, we got to start putting some respect on Trey Hendrickson's name. I get it. I get it. He's not uh, Cam Jordan. Cam Jordan's an all-decade uh, all decade team member. He's not uh, even Marcus Davenport. Just from like a physical standpoint, Marcus Davenport is an absolute monster. Like I said, you watch Marcus Davenport, you know he looks freaky. Trey doesn't look like that. He doesn't even wear gloves. It's like the ultimate blue-collar move. But you know what he does do? He produces consistently. And at a certain point, I don't care what your intangibles are, how impressive you look to the naked eye, the production is what ultimately matters. So put some respect on Taysom Hill's name. He is playing like a top five pass rusher, not like the Saints, but in the entirety of the NFL, and that is not an exaggeration. And then while we're on the defensive line, of course, Cam and Marcus Davenport maybe not getting the most gaudy of stats, no, like 10 pressures or nine pressures, the big sacks, but uh, the consistent pressure that they apply to the quarterback psyche, to the offensive line psyche, and just consistent pressure they apply off the edge it makes everything work. So really, you had a great, you, you, you had very multiple great symbiotic interactions between this defense's last game. On Yamada on the inside, helping the edge, the hedge, helping the inside, having them step up into him. The overall pass rush, being able to get home with four means you can drop more guys into coverage. Uh, speeding up Tom Brady's clock makes the coverage better. Why did he throw three picks? Because of the pressure. So when the line looks better, the secondary looks better, everything worked. And for whatever reason, the Saints defensive line is in Tampa's head. Like, I don't expect this to be week in and week out, but it will be better than they looked for a lot of the first half of this season. When you look at how guys continue to evolve, right? Sheldon rankings go down. David Onmata gets a greater workload. He is taking advantage. The emergence of Marcus Davenport has added that missing element that pushes you over the line. Other things that I like from Sunday's game. How about Adam Troutman? The rookie tight end, speaking of PFF Saints, he had a 90.6 grade on 29 snaps, 89 grade when it comes to catching the ball, 75 run block grade, which is impressive given how young he is and how kind of tall and thin he is. Three targets, three catches, 39 yards, and a score. Adam Troutman, it's weird. I wonder how much of an impact player he could become this season because he looks like even more so than Jared Cook, exactly what Drew Brees has been missing at that tight end position for years. That throw and catch of the touchdown was beautiful. I mean, look, I mean, it, it, Danny, if they show the end zone replay of, of that right there for our YouTube uh, watchers, uh, the window that Drew Brees throws this into is is unreal. But then Troutman has to go make him right, and he did that. It's kind of sad, though, right? How long will Troutman and Brees have developed this relationship? It may just be this year, but I wonder if this second half of the season down the stretch he can't become more impact player. We'll have to wait and see. So overall, when you look at Sunday, it was pure domination. It was the Saints showing up and establishing that we are NFL Super Bowl contenders. And a lot of it was due to Sean Payton and his masterful game plan, perfectly executed by Breeze in the offense. And then that Saints defensive line just kicking ass and making life so much easier for the rest of that defense and Dennis Allen. 
And you're never going to do it like that as, you know, you're not going to play to that level every week. But if you can continue to land in that range, continue to move towards that direction, yeah, then you those are the elements that you need to win in the playoffs. And the Saints are starting to display those. So exciting times if you're an Orleans Saints fan. All right, when we get back, uh, let's go ahead and dive into the NFL as a whole as we will close the book on the week that was, kind of look at where everything stands. And uh, we'll do that next here on OTBOT. OTB. OT.